Good afternoon. If I could welcome you, I'm Ralph Hexter. I'm Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor. I want to uh, welcome you all to the second lecture in our series, the Provost Forum on the Public University and the Social Good. We're extremely pleased to have as our distinguished speaker today, Professor Roger Geiger, who will discuss the past and future of the innovative university. Professor Geiger's presentation, which I was privileged enough to see in an early draft, is both thought-provoking and informed by his deep knowledge of the history of American higher education. This sort of historical grounding is essential if we are better to understand the tradition of the public university today and its possibilities for the future. I vow to keep my introductory remarks brief, as I know that we are all eager to hear Professor Geiger, but I do want to provide a little context for those of you who may not be familiar with the goals of this lecture series. As everyone here knows, the University of California is in the midst of one of the most critical periods in its history. For the past several years especially, the 10 UC campuses have faced extremely difficult choices as they attempt to cope with sharply diminished funding in the state of California. Inevitably, determining the right way to respond to this more austere economic climate has pro proved a formidable challenge, as well as a source of passionate debate within the UC system and beyond. At the center of the debate is the question of what the University of California and any public university should and can be in the 21st century. Since the campus events on and around November 18th, 2011, the topic has assumed a special relevance, especially here at UC Davis. In response, the Office of the Chancellor and the Office of the Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor have committed to facilitating an inclusive and productive dialogue in the future of the public university that is so important for all of us. As part of this commitment, our two offices have established a web page residing on my website in support of lectures, panels, forums, and other campus events designed by, offered for the benefit of the UC Davis community. In addition, to complement other campus events, my office established the Provost Forums on the Public University and the Social Good. This focused scholarly series is aimed at furthering awareness and dialogue on this important topic within and beyond the university community. It is also aimed at exploring the potential to make UC Davis a center for the study of the role of the public university in contemporary society. This academic year, the series features eight public presentations by expert speakers plus associated events. The presentations are overseen by my office in cooperation with the university's Center for Regional Change. To learn more about the Provost Forum, I invite you to consult the Future of the Public University page on my website. There you'll find a complete calendar of the eight lectures scheduled for 2012-13. Advertisements and supplementary materials for each event and videos of past events. You'll also find my opening remarks for the inaugural forum held in October 2012, which address the tasks before us as we attempt properly to envision the public university of the 21st century. So before I yield the podium, a few thanks. First and foremost to Professor Geiger for traveling to our campus to share with us his deep knowledge and thoughtful analysis next to our oversight committee for their excellent work in arranging this and the other forms in the 2012-13 academic year. This committee, uh, the committee's members are Martin Kenny, David Campbell, Jonathan London, and Luis Eduardo Guarnitza, and program manager Alicia Thompson. To the co-sponsors with my office of today's event, the Community and Regional Development Program and the Center for Regional Change. And finally, to all of you for being here today on a Friday afternoon. This series is intended not only to be smart and informative, but also critically useful to the larger dialogue on the public university. Your participation in these forums and your subsequent sharing of what you hear here with others is a key mechanism by which the series will help us identify and clarify issues, formulate effective solutions, and create consensus among stakeholders. As I step away, I'll remind you that you're all invited to remain for a reception in this room immediately following the lecture. And now I yield the podium to Professor Kenny, who will introduce Professor Geiger. Thank you. So first I should thank uh, 
Provost Hexter for providing the support to make making these four possible. And Talisha Thompson for her uh, invaluable and incredible efforts to organize this event and keep it running on time. Third, I would, we would like to announce that there is a third event in this series, Making the People's University, Exploring the Civic Mission of the Public Land Grant Universities and Cooperative Extension on February 22nd. So please watch for that. That'll be an exciting event. It is my great pleasure to introduce brought some of his books. I couldn't find two other books that are lost in my mess, but it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Professor Roger Geiger, whose, re whose work on the research university has really helped inform my thinking about universities. I've been a fan of his uh, work for nearly two decades. Our committee thought that he would be an ideal person to come give us his views uh, and inform us from the historical perspective about the public university and the social good. He's a distinguished professor of higher education at the Pennsylvania State University, former head of the higher education program. He's without a doubt the foremost scholar in this area. He's the author of innumerable articles, books, editorials, and other writings about the American university. Most notable for me are his books on the American Research University in the 20th century. The two I really like to highlight are To Advance Knowledge, The Development of the American Research Universities, 1900 to 1940. That's one of these. And, uh, and Research and Relevant Knowledge, American Research Universities since uh, World War II. These are classics. If you're interested, you should read them. More recently, in two books, Tapping the Riches of Science and Knowledge, knowledge and Money, Research Universities and the Paradox of the Marketplace, it's just a very excellent book, examining the dilemmas and conundrums that research universities face in a time when research results can be transformed into large capital gains. And they face increasing pressure to commercialize these results. Today he's writing a history of the American University that we're all looking forward to reading. He's promised me it will be about four to 500 pages. I immediately assumed it would be 800 to 1,000. <laughs> he's promised me no, so we can read it in a weekend or so. Uh, to provide some measure of how comprehensive his interests are, the titles of two of his recent edited works are The Land Grant Colleges and the Reshaping of American Higher Education and Higher Education for African Americans Before the Civil Rights Act, 1900 to 1964, both of which are in his annual series, uh, Perspectives on the History of Higher Education. I could continue listing his achievements, but I think it would be better to hear from Professor Geiger. So without further ado, I present <laughs> Professor Geiger. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for that uh, very, very kind in introduction. Uh, I teach in a, in a higher education program, and the uh, students in higher education uh, in my program and elsewhere probably know me best for uh, uh, an article that I did called The Ten Generations of American Higher Education. And uh, we're going to try to... Um, I'm going to try to communicate here for, to get the uh, PowerPoints. I think you have to do, do it one more time. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the premise of this, uh, of this, well, the reason that, that uh, it's my best known uh, piece is because it's been anthologized and uh, it's, in it's assigned in students' classes as kind of an overview of, of the history of American higher education. Now, the premise of this, which uh, I, I first draft, I wrote a long time ago, was that about every 30 years, it seems like, uh, there are major changes, not just in one aspect of higher education, but really a, sort of across the board. And that um, um, by, by arranging it in, in these generations, I, I was able to uh, um, sort of ask good questions about, uh, well, if this changed, what else changed? And uh, change over time is, is really what history is all about. And uh, change over time is something that's very difficult to identify in ongoing institutions, uh, which sometimes look like they're, they're not changing. But uh, uh, for our, of interest uh, today is, of course, uh, Generation 10, um, with, which uh, 
began with changes that took place in and around 1980. And uh, what happened then? But, well, these, these changes uh, are not, sometimes not abrupt, uh, sometimes they take some time. Uh, the character, the dynamics of enrollments in higher education changed from about 1975 to, uh, the, to the early 80s. The financing of higher education changed abruptly uh, beginning in, in 1978. And uh, almost, <coughs> well, in, for uh, what we're talking about today, uh, the involvement of universities in, in the commercial economy, uh, there the, the uh, changes were long in, in coming, but uh, they were symbolized by events that took place in, in uh, 1980. Well, uh, and, and uh, really touched off what, uh, what I'm calling today the innovative university, uh, in that uh, it's, it's innovations that uh, the, the commercial economy looks to the university for. And the, of course, if the 30-year uh, uh, timetable holds then, um, the uh, Generation 10, the current era, is at the end of its, its rope. Uh, important changes should be taking place around 1910, and in fact, that's exactly what uh, I'm going to uh, talk about. So for, um, this is what my talk is about. It's the, the changes. Uh, that have taken place in the innovative university in, during the current era, and uh, what uh, we might expect uh, in uh, the, the years to follow. Now, <clears throat> to appreciate the, cur the current era uh, and why it's, it uh, is a, a really a substantial break from the past, you have to, to look back at uh, the, the, the prior period, and particularly the developments during uh, the dismal 70s. Uh, the dismal 70s were characterized by retrenchment, uh, uh, by, by uh, uh, disenchantment with higher education, uh, budgetary pressures. Uh, but uh, it, the 70s really represented the, the end of uh, three of the, of the strongest secular movements of the mid 20th century. Uh, it was the end of demographic expansion and enrollments in higher education. and. Uh, the, uh, and the culmination of a, of a growing publicness of higher education as a whole, and as well as the consolidation of vastly expanded federal responsibilities for research. Uh, the 1960s was the most expansive decade in the history of American higher education. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> but this growth slowed after 1970 and stopped after 1975. And you can sort of see the representation there. Uh, but uh, for the first, for, and as of 1975, for the first time in our nation's history, enrollments in higher education ceased to grow. And they did not grow appreciably for, for uh, an another uh, two decades at least. So, and this stagnation was accompanied by an alienation from academic culture. There was a huge defection from the liberal arts and sciences and from uh, education too towards vocational subjects, particularly business majors. A weak job market that depressed the, the wage premium received by college graduates led to exaggerated charges of overeducated Americans. Pundits extrapolated worse conditions ahead. Uh, the, the, um, the current era uh, is, is known for privatization, but we don't have a word for the opposite of privatization. But that, that's really what occurred from 1945 to 1980. Uh, there, uh, American states poured enormous resources into building public systems of higher education. Flagship universities, uh, regional universities, public urban universities, uh, community colleges. The public share of total enrollments, which was one half in 1950, reached 79% in 1975. Um, but uh, <coughs> um, the uh, 70s are perceived to be a time of financial hardship. Retrenchment was the, hard, was the watchword. But real public funding actually increased until the last years of the decade, reaching its highest level ever for per, for per student outlays in 1977. Uh, and that's kind of a depressing fact. Uh, real tuition at public universities declined modestly or increased less rapidly than inflation in those years. And moreover, the education amendments of 1972 provided a huge new infusion of public funds for higher education. The opposite side of this growing publicness was the perilous condition of the private sector. 
there was widespread concern that uh, public colleges and universities were going to go out of business. The uh, financial aid legislation of 1972 was specifically designed to uh, keep the, uh, the private sector afloat. Um, and uh, <coughs> private colleges and universities experimented with ways to become more affordable, more vocational, or more accessible to a broader clientele. Private tuitions were stable for the decade relative to family incomes. This figure is a remarkable uh, uh, illustration of what I'm talking about. Uh, this is from Claudia Golden and, and uh, Lawrence Katz, The Race Between Education and Technology, which uh, 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 just by the way is, is one of the, the most uh, striking uh, testimonies to the social good that uh, higher education uh, um, uh, can bring. But uh, you see that from 1950 to 1980, uh, public tuition and private tuition were stable in terms of, of uh, median family income. And beginning in 1980, it, it uh, abruptly shot upward. And this graph leaves out the last 10 years. So if, we, if you put that in, it's, it's off the chart. Um, <coughs> so <coughs> the, uh, the, the last years of the 70s really represented the high watermark for public support for higher education and the, the apogee of access to of U.S. students to low-cost, well-furbished, publicly supported post-secondary education. And interestingly, low cost and wide availability did not sustain enrollment growth. Public funding for access was not accompanied by public confidence in higher education. Uh, <coughs> in fact, uh, everywhere the, the uh, social expenditures uh, began to be challenged. Internationally, this was called the crisis of the welfare state. Still no one in these years foresaw a resurgence of private higher education. Let me turn to research then. Uh, burgeoning federal support for university research created a, a golden age for uh, a decade after the Soviet launch of Sputnik in 1957. Uh, expenditures for acad academic research flattened out uh, from 1968 to 75 and then, then rose only modestly into, until the mid 80s. Uh, more significantly, there was a great deal of pessimism surrounding the academic research enterprise. Federal agencies, uh, taking their cue from politicians, sought practical results from research investment. Universities took the money but did not embrace the practical goals. After being hammered for performing defense research, they generally harbored an ivory tower mentality, preferring uh, pure academic research. Uh, they were thus doubly frustrated by the contraction of uh, funding and by the redirection of federal uh, research. Ties with industry were sparse, uh, with some, a few exceptions, but overall industry supported just over 3% of academic research. So in some, the, the forces that had long sustained these three vast historical movements uh, were by the end of the 1970s pretty much exhausted. And uh, moreover, the premises on which they had mobilized people and public spending were now being challenged. Um, an additional wild card was the inflation that raged from uh, 1978 to 1982, raising the cost of living by 50%. Uh, but rapidly ri rising prices drove home a sense of crisis and uh, encouraged a willingness to try new, th new things. So what happened around 1980? Several largely unrelated developments set in motion forces that transformed the way we finance uh, higher education. Uh, these were the ramping up of, st of federal student loans uh, on a large scale and the start of uh, tuition discounting. Um, federal student loans really took off with uh, something called the Middle Income S Student Assistant Act of, of 1978, which made guaranteed student loans available to everyone regardless of, uh, of income. And uh, a lot of people took, took, uh, took advantage of this, and loans quickly mushroomed, uh, doubling to $9 billion from 77 to 1980. Um, but uh, even when income caps were reimposed in 1981, uh, loans didn't go down, but they kept, uh, kept on growing. And they've been ratcheting upward ever since. Um, higher education had tapped into a new source of revenue the future earnings of its students, and it would only encourage the Sloan culture uh, that this had spawned. Uh, 
1978 was also uh, when Harvard University made a policy decision to boost its tuition price by 18 percent, or $700, which was unprecedented in, uh, at that time, and to, in, in compensation to increase student financial aid with internal funds. Well, uh, to make a long story short, no price resistance uh, surfaced, and they kept raising their tuition by large amounts, and, and so did all their competitors. The entire private sector in the 1980s uh, adopted this position, this um, practice of uh, tuition discounting or differential pricing. The genius of these two practices soon became apparent. By subsidizing the most price sensitive students with discounts and loans, tuition could be raised without affecting demand. The policy of high tuition, high aid was adopted throughout the private sector and uh, of course eventually leaked into the public sector. And it was one important factor in reversing the decline of private higher education. In the 1980s, private institutions began to outperform public universities, and that trend has strengthened since then. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the trend in loans and tuition discounting have not only persisted but intensified in recent years. Student loan debt is, uh, now exceeds $1 trillion, more than all credit card debt. And, uh, uh, and uh, more than state appropriations for higher education or all tuition income. Moreover, it's, quad it's quadrupled in the last uh, eight years. And tuition discount in the private sector now uh, averaged 42 percent. So if you think about this, uh, would anyone devise a policy for financing higher education in which s shaky student loans would be the largest source of funds? Would any institution adopt a, pol a tuition policy that yielded 58 cents on the dollar? These policies, uh, once set in motion, developed according to their own momentum, uh, in one case driven by market logic, in the other by defects in the federal loan student loan policy. The other side of this coin is the disinvestment of, of, of by states in public higher education. The rising percent of, uh, of tuition incomes is painted by by this picture, and uh, this is another way of, of uh, expressing it. So <clears throat> state universities really cannot engage in tuition discounting for several reasons. Basically, they have too few affluent students. Their students have relied instead on federal loans to meet the rising tuitions, which is one large factor in the quadrupling of outstanding loans. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the, the issue of rising costs in higher education is a much larger topic. My point here is that the funding that made this rise possible, namely differential pricing and, and student loans, were artifacts of the current era. And, uh, and that today, at the end of that era, their sustainability is very much in doubt. Uh, another necessary condition uh, for this was the, what I call the selectivity sweepstakes. And uh, here, uh, you, have, you have to realize that in, in the private sector in the 1970s was uh, trying to cut costs uh, and reduce tuition. Uh, they were worried about that they didn't have, have pricing power. This changed after 1980s uh, with uh, a tremendous marketing efforts in the public sector. And uh, in 1983, a catalyst of sort was the first ranking of colleges by U.S. News and World Report. Uh, the, these rankings not only proved enormously popular, but soon had a significant uh, effect on the number of applications, the yield of matriculating students, and the amount of financial aid needed to recruit a class. So this, too, was part of the, the changing enrollment dynamics of um, higher education. So how, <coughs> how do these uh, factors affect the innovative university? Well, basically, they threaten the business model of the American Research University. Um, and uh, it's, be it's becoming increasingly obvious uh, to people uh, who look at these things that, uh, that this is the case. Ronald Ehrenberg, who's, who uh, the economist at Cornell has written as much as any, anyone about this, uh, posed the question in a recent paper, is the golden age of private research university over? His answer is that the financial model that private research universities operate under is under great stress and is breaking down. And of course, privates are a lot better off than the publics. The factor he cites have been around a long time. Tuition rising by 3% above the CPI for 30 years, tuition discounts above 40%, uh, the crunch in, fu in funding research, and administrative bloat. 
But now he foresees these pressures will dictate fundamental changes. For another opinion, Moody's uh, recent assessment of, high, of the higher education sector reported that the pricing power of colleges has reached an inflection point where higher tuition is no longer increasing net tuition. For another opinion, The Economist has chimed in, declaring American universities represent declining value for money to their students. It foresees a trend towards the unbundling of higher education, um, which would not be a good thing for Clark Gurr's multiversity. And uh, in last week's Science, Norman Augustine uh, listed all the, the uh, factors, uh, the, the, the disruptive factors uh, that uh, are affecting and potentially affecting higher education. And then he, he made reference to uh, the aerospace industry, which he, which he was a CEO for. And uh, the title of his article is, uh, We Never Saw It Coming. So uh, there's, there's a, almost a consensus, consensus out there that uh, the, these forces that are pressuring the research university and the research university model are uh, coming to a head. Um, the, uh, for public universities, the um, um, last year two major government reports warned of an impending crisis um, and uh, chiefly caused by, by the, the long contraction of, uh, of uh, state support. Well, this is one expression of uh, state support, and uh, the, um, these are the two reports that uh, uh, um, that articulate uh, th this problem. Um, of course, these reports come out periodically, and uh, they, are, they tend to articulate the same problem. But uh, but they're, they're they're kind of like benchmarks, you know, to uh, to to measure where we are. Um, so, um, the, uh, the, the great fear is that uh, the lack of, of state support for public uh, universities it will lead to a decline of, of their capacity to support graduate education and, and uh, research. So, uh, I'll, I'll come back to that, but, but first I want to look at the, the research universities as sources of innovation. Um, my focus here is the input of university research to technolo technological innovation uh, and what is called in the profession TBED, technology-based economic development. And if invention is the first emergence of an idea uh, for a new product or process, innovation is a uh, successful effort to carry it out in practice. In some ways, this ranks innovation above invention. Uh, William Baumel, uh, the venerable economist has argued that, that virtually all of economic growth that has occurred since the 18th century, that's a lot, <laughs> is ultimately attributable to innovation. Uh, oddly, innovation only emerged as a topic of academic interest in the 1970s, but uh, it has really taken off in, in the, uh, uh, the late 1990s. Well, for universities, there are really two uh, tracks of innovation. Uh, ba Baumol emphasizes the first one, this corporate track. Uh, it's innovation that takes place in corporate laboratories. Uh, most of our uh, industries operate under conditions of oligopolistic competition. Mature high-tech industries largely consist of a handful of dominant large corporations that compete only obliquely with one another. By constantly developing new and improved products, they differentiate their goods and services from those of their rivals. Universities have long played a, a, a role in this track for innovation by providing scientific assistance uh, for the efforts of corporate labs. But that contribution has been and still is uh, rather limited. The second track of innovation is the one that really took off uh, after 1980. And uh, it's in inventions that, that produce new products or processes. This track operates largely through patents and licenses um, and the commercialization of, of new inventions in, entails both market risk and technological risk. They are typically commercialized by smaller companies or startups, which are less, averse to, uh, less risk averse than large corporations. Uh, for example, 16% of uh, university licenses are taken out by startups, and 54% uh, are taken out uh, taken up by small companies, uh, only leaving only 30% of uh, licensed by large corporations. Um, 
<coughs> so um, universities in the past were, before 1980, were only marginally involved in this track with occasional serendipitous inventions. Uh, and in fact, uh, the research corporation administered most of those academic uh, patents. The, uh, the, the university's role in, in uh, these three innovation tracks was revolutionized around 1980. And uh, a very good book has just come out uh, called Creating the Market University, how, how Academic Science Became an Economic Engine. And uh, these are the three areas that uh, the, the author Elizabeth Berman looks at. Um, and uh, these, are, these are areas that uh, Martin Kenny and I have both written about a great deal. But she uh, analyzes the background uh, uh, in an interesting way. And uh, she describes how uh, people were attempting to develop these areas for a long time, but universities were, were really not interested in, in cooperating for a number of, of reasons. Um, but uh, what changed around 1980, she found, was the rise of an innovation policy frame uh, in those years that blamed the country's declining economic competitiveness on lack of innovation and advocated technology transfer as part of the solution. Around 1980, this became the consensus and uh, a, a number of, of laws changed to make uh, this possible. Um, the uh, of course, the decisive change in patenting was the famous Bayh-Dole Act of 1980, uh, which directed universities to patent discoveries made through federally funded research. But this was accompanied by a creation of a more favorable patenting environment, particularly for biotech. Biotechnology uh, was, of course, the, the great scientific revolution of, of uh, those years. Um, and it, but its development was facilitated as well by government decisions. Uh, the government was going to regulate the field, but then backed off and did not. There's an important court case that legalized the patenting of living organisms. And in 1980, uh, the enterprise model of Genentech uh, received uh, uh, spectacular validation with a, 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 a Wall Street IPO. Uh, in, in the corporate innovation track, New ground was broken by NSF's industry university cooperative research programs and then by the engineering research centers. So the government uh, uh, has always been interested in, in promoting this, uh, this kind of innovation. And uh, the, these were accompanied by a number of state programs aimed at uh, promoting in university industry cooperation. Um, these developments might be said to have launched the innovative university. And uh, my book with Chris Osa, Tapping the Riches of Science, uh, brings this story up to the eve of the Great uh, Recession. Um, the, um, uh, <coughs> now Berman notes that uh, the transformation of the 1980s, uh, there have been, well, uh, she says that not, not uh, fairly f f few new mechanisms have come out, but uh, there have been uh, some uh, developments. Basically, in, uh, the, um, in the inventive track, uh, public policies have, have emphasized uh, uh, helping inventors make the transition over, over what was, what's known as the valley of death, which is going from a proof of concept to uh, a, a working prototype that uh, people can, have, can actually invest in. And uh, they've done this by, by uh, subsidizing uh, uh, arrangements for pre-business pre incubators in order to develop uh, uh, inventions, by trying to involve entrepreneurs and venture capitalists at an early stage to help uh, these things along. MIT, uh, the Dish Pond Center, has prob probably been the leader there. And uh, an effort to uh, provide managerial assistance to uh, uh, startup companies. Uh, similarly, in the corporate innovation track, uh, federal and state policies have, have uh, uh, done a good deal to, to strengthen this track. The Engineering Research Center program has been uh, renewed twice. It's in, in its third generation now. The um, NSF and a number of other federal agencies require uh, corporate partners for, for many of their larger grants. Uh, some state programs uh, uh, provide uh, direct assistance for research professorships. And uh, state policies to seed university industry research centers uh, uh, have been prominent in, 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 uh, in those states. So what have been the results? Um, 
For corporate sponsorship of research, the changes after 1980 were dramatic. Corporate contributions to total academic research rose from 3% to 6% in the 1980s and then edged up to 7% by the end of the century. However, at that point, this, this long secular expansion of, uh, uh, of corporate-sponsored uh, university research faltered. For the first time ever, it, uh, it actually went, went into a downtrend. And um, um, it went down for a while, went up again, and then uh, has headed down and uh, is probably stabilizing now. But uh, the point is that this growth has, has been broken. And there's no ex systematic explanation for this pattern. Um, in, uh, <clears throat> um, in fact, give, given the kind of public support for corporate university uh, interactions, it seems like it should be increasing. The, the trend in, in the industry is open innovation. And these are some of the uh, reasons given for it, uh, for this. Uh, there's always, there's a conflict over uh, intellectual property rights. Uh, corporations are investing a lot more overseas, but the balance of, tr balance of trade in research greatly favors the United States. And there are inherent limitations to corporate demand for university research. Uh, but I think that this last one is competition from, more, from other uh, institutions is most important. And here, uh, this only covers up through 2005, but you can see that, that uh, during this period of contraction in uh, uh, college, and university, college and university performance, the uh, corporations were contracting out to other industries. And what, where was this going? Well, university startups, for one thing, uh, in, in areas like biotechnology, nanotechnology, they do much more focused research that uh, is corporate, corporations value much more. Then there are government programs like SBIRs, STTRs, which I'm not going to go into, uh, but uh, they provide government subsidies for this kind of research as well. Um, <clears throat> so the... Um, um, uh, however, there's another dimension to this issue, and, and that is that uh, although uh, corporations are not doing a great deal of research with industry, they, they uh, have a, a great deal of support for uh, university research. In fact, university, university research has, been, has uh, really benefited from the support of, of two strategic sources, industry and governors. The National Governors Association has been a, a cheerleader for uh, for university research since 2000 and for technology-based economic development. And uh, in, industrial associations uh, have uh, uh, supported it as well. Uh, there's, they, <laughs> if you want to know why uh, the, the decision was made to double the NIH budget, uh, um, that, that was uh, seven or eight years ago, um, it's because uh, there's a great deal of support in, in, uh, in industry. And uh, why is that? Um, well, here you can see uh, the forms of corporate university uh, research relationships, and uh, they really cover a lot, a lot of things beyond uh, uh, industry-sponsored research. And in fact, uh, in a widely studi cited study, uh, uh, it was identified that the most important source of R&D information for industrial labs uh, from universities was public science, um, that is, publications and conferences. Uh, the next most important source was, was interactions with individuals, um, and uh, both informal interactions and also uh, hiring uh, of students and so forth. So um, the, these, these kinds of, of relationships with industry are much more important uh, than uh, simply uh, uh, the amount of, of, of research that uh, corporations uh, support. Um, now, when it comes to Invention patenting uh, that track of innovation. It's much more. It's a little bit more difficult to analyze, and uh, in fact, I, I hesitate to speak on this subject because uh, uh, Martin is uh, developing a, a database that's going to uh, tell us a, a good deal more about this. Um, in in my uh, in our book, uh, we looked at um, uh, the the metrics for. Um, uh, for measuring the uh, patenting, licensing, and uh, startups for uh, uh, coming out of universities uh, compared to, to research dollars. And a, a fairly clear picture emerged. Up until 1998 or, there, or thereabouts, uh, 
the output of, uh, of intellectual property from universities was, was uh, in, uh, advancing faster than the inputs of uh, university research. But then after 1998, uh, the, the, the um, conditions seemed to stabilize. And uh, outputs kept growing, but uh, they were growing at the same, same rate as inputs of, of research, and perhaps not as fast as the inputs of, of technology licensing officers. Um, and uh, so I, uh, for this talk, I, I carried this forward to 2011, and I found no change. Uh, these, these figures are almost meaningless. <laughs> But, uh, but basically, there, there's, uh, there's still the same relationship uh, where, uh, that uh, the outputs of patents and licenses are, uh, keep growing, but uh, pretty much in keeping with, the, uh, with research measured in uh, constant dollars. So, the, uh, <clears throat> so, I mean, the upshot of this is that uh, while uh, these national reports are saying how important it is uh, for us to increase the the innovation uh, production uh, of, of universities, uh, it doesn't seem to be happening in the corporate, in terms of, of uh, corporate uh, research relationships. And uh, it's, uh, we're certainly not increasing the output of, uh, of pat patents and, and licenses uh, beyond uh, the, the inputs. So, <clears throat> so the question, um, what does all this mean then for the future of uh, the innovative university? And uh, here, uh, being warned by such sages as Niels Bohr and uh, Yogi Berra, I, of course, uh, will be very modest. Um, but uh, how can we determine if, this, if 2010 is a change point and that, if the second, that the second decade of the 21st century represents a new era for higher education and the innovative university. Well, uh, what I like to do as an historian is, is to try to identify large quantitative changes. They may not tell the whole story, but uh, they tell you that something is, is happening. And uh, um, um, so what are the changes that have been taking, have been taking place in, in uh, higher education? Uh, well, one is the, the rise of for-profit higher education. And uh, boy, if that isn't a, a rapid change uh, from 4% to 13% in one, in, uh, one decade, uh, I, I don't know what is. Uh, second change is online learning. And here, I don't need to present any statistics. Uh, you can pick up the Chronicle of Higher Education any day and read about the latest uh, uh, developments in online education and MOOCs. Uh, as novel as MOOCs are, I really don't think that they're the game changer. Rather, we should look at the continual expansion of online education. For example, Penn State has added 10,000 students in the last decade, all of them online. Um, and uh, my own program, the higher education program, has uh, a uh, certificate program in, uh, that we offer online. And uh, uh, it's been very successful. And why do we do it? Uh, because online education is uh, tremendously overpriced and we, we earn money that we can use to support our doctoral students. And uh, the big secret is that online education is simply uh, way overpriced, and that's, why, uh, that's one reason why it's, it's, it's growing fast and will keep growing until uh, we get a Walmart of higher education to come along and, and offer it at a, a, a reasonable price. Uh, th third big change, uh, uh, contingent faculty. Uh, now, you'll see a lot of statistics on uh, so-called contingent faculty, but usually they include part-time faculty. And of course, there, there are uh, enormous numbers of part-time faculty, and it's hard to know what they mean. What, what, what's more important is the, the growth of, of non-tenure track uh, full-time faculty. And you can see that uh, this, this uh, covers from 92 to 2007, but the, the big growth is uh, since uh, since 1999, it's, it's, the, it's after 2000, and in both public and private uh, sector, that's where the growth in, in uh, faculty is. There's almost no growth uh, in regular faculty, uh, which is a problem. Um, uh, finally, uh, there's the, the affordability crisis. Uh, and uh, here, student loan debt is, uh, uh, 
the main problem. So I, I thought I'd express it with all the zeros so you could really appreciate it. And, uh, but look, in eight years, it's quadrupled. And uh, if, uh, if it keeps going at that rate, it would be $4 trillion in 2020, and uh, it would probably equal the uh, gross national product in 2030. This is an uns unsustainable growth. And uh, what are we doing about it? Nothing. <laughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. So this, these are the kind of changes that uh, have to be, uh, these are the realities of what's happening in higher education. And the question is then, what, what uh, do we, do, we uh, do about it? Well, um, on the other side, we, we have sort of the hopes and the expectations of uh, what we'd like to see happen in higher education. And uh, these are best expressed as, as policy agendas. These are arguments advanced by policy communities by, and policy entrepreneurs seeking to advance or, or perpetuate their particular interests. Um, and uh, for, for simplicity, there are different policy uh, agendas for undergraduate education and graduate education and research. For undergraduate education, uh, of course, uh, greater affordability is, is uh, wanted. Uh, everybody wants more access. We want to improve student learning. Um, I, don't, I doubt if we could even, if we had an intelligent policy could achieve two of the, of the three. Um, but uh, um, the policy agenda for uh, the academic scientific community for, for, uh, for research and innovation, well, these are just statements from the, uh, these two, pol these two uh, reports. And uh, uh, the keys to America's future is uh, to reaffirm and revitalize the unique partnership that has long exhibited, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so they, um, I mean, these are serious arguments and uh, you know, they, they may be true for all I know. Uh, but uh, uh, once again, um, there's uh, a problem in getting from uh, where we are now to uh, where uh, these uh, agendas would like us to be. Now, the most, the most fundamental problem, I think, is that the tr traditional model of the research university is, is threatened, as I, as I indicated. Um, the uh, ratcheting downward of state appropriations, uh, the, uh, the rise in tuition, um, the latest survey of freshmen reveals them to be the most cost conscious and their behaviors more affected by costs than ever before. Uh, we are running into price resistance. And yet the latest survey of university business managers reported uh, that their dominant strategy for both public and private universities was to increase net tuition revenues. So given the affordability crisis and crushing student debt, this seems unlikely, and uh, Moody's thinks that uh, uh, too. So the increase in contingent faculty should be viewed as a symptom of the inability of universities to expand their faculties according to the traditional model. It is somewhat cheaper and more efficient to create purely teaching positions. But this situation is related to the growth of online learning and the affordability crisis. Uh, you don't need um, active scholars and researchers to provide online uh, education. Uh, there's, there can be no doubt that online learning has become a permanent part of higher education. The question still to be answered is, in the words of William, William Bowen, who wrote a, who's gave a great talk on this, it's available, uh, whether or not online learning in many of its manifestations can lead to good learning outcomes at lower cost. Uh, and after some initial skepticism, Bowen now believes that it can. Uh, my interest here is the impact of such a solution on university faculty. Most faculty did not become professors to perform the kind of tasks that an online format requires. And uh, Bowman sees that uh, and envisions a university in which faculty expend a great deal of their efforts in teaching uh, activities. Now, this may appeal to some, but more ominous, where does the lower cost come from? Costs for technology, infrastructure, and uh, support personnel will uh, increase. Uh, the cost savings will have to come from the faculty. This might mean fewer faculty or contingent faculty, and it would certainly mean faculty dedicated to teaching. It's hard to see how this could be implemented without lessening the sum total of faculty expertise and learning in research universities. 
Now, this situation should be uh, of uh, concern for research for the research policy com community. Um, <coughs> the figure showing the increase of contingent faculty, as I said, revealed uh, the minimal growth of full-time tenure-track faculty in both public and private universities from 1992 to 2007, and it hasn't changed since 2007, I can tell you that. This core faculty is, they're the bearers of the expertise uh, of the university, and they have increased less than total faculty, less than administrators, less than students, less than research funds, and less than the growth of knowledge. So this situation has created a bottleneck in the academic pipeline. Uh, in the humanities, it has long been evident in the lack of academic positions for new cohorts of PhDs. In the sciences, it's manifest in the growing length of postdoctoral appointments. Uh, postdocs in, in biology is worse. Postdocs have increased by 25% in the last 10 years. Um, the, uh, the report, Research Universities in the Future of America, recommends strategies to accommodate uh, young PhDs, uh, but they depend on federal funding for federally endowed professorships. Uh, don't hold your breath for that one. Um, so the, uh, um, the policies that are advocating greater innovation, uh, uh, greater research uh, from our universities are, are, are also ignoring some realities. So the, the academic research economy is heavily dependent on, on federal funding, of course, um, and there, there are two possible scenarios there. The administration, the Obama, Obama administration has been very supportive towards academic research, um, and uh, it will probably will continue to be so. On the other hand, Congress uh, wants to, uh, if Congress were to establish a budget deal, uh, it would probably cut uh, funding across the board. and, and uh, University research would take their lumps like everyone else. Uh, my best hope is that federal research support will remain stable for a while, making a few initiatives possible, uh, perhaps with little funding behind them, and probably tilted towards uh, industry uh, uh, needs. Um, the, the momentum behind innovation and technology-based economic development, that is the, the ideological momentum uh, still remains very strong. And until these, these kinds of policies are questioned, uh, additions to federal programs uh, uh, will continue to be oriented towards economically relevant uh, academic science. So how will the innovative university cope with these conditions? In a nutshell, with undergraduate instruction and core funding under severe budgetary pressure, and research and graduate education benefiting from association with, with economic development, these two realms are likely to be uh, pulled in, in opposite directions. The distinguishing feature of uh, the trend in instruction is the growth in contingent, and on, contingent faculty and online learning. The distinguishing feature of graduate education and research are found in centers and institu institutes, what uh, the University of California called ORUs, Organized Research Units, and uh, which uh, Clark Kerr used to uh, develop the, the academic uh, superiority of the UC system. Um, but uh, the, um, um, <clears throat> but the result is an increasing bifurcation of the faculty between those whose job is teaching and those devoted mainly to research and scholarship. And uh, in a previous paper on this topic, I concluded by asking, how close are we to the tipping point that would radically undermine the traditional faculty role? Um, I don't know, but five years later, uh, we're closer than we were when I wrote that. The, uh, <coughs> the traditional role of a tenure-track university professor is unique in the amount of continual investment made by employers in human capital or intellectual growth. Uh, the quid, 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 quid pro quo, of course, is that uh, the, these resources will be employed to develop a very high level of expertise in a specialized field and to employ that expertise to advance the field through research and publications, sharing that knowledge uh, with others through service, and in addition to teaching. Individuals who meet these criteria are rewarded with tenure and the university continues to invest in their knowledge growth until retirement. 
universities do not invest in the intellectual growth of non-tenure track faculty. Um, and uh, thus, uh, they fulfill a job, but uh, they don't add to the, the uh, overall learning and expertise of uh, the institutions. The activities of research faculty at, 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 at innovative universities have increasingly revolved around centers and institutes. Uh, and this trend uh, should strengthen. Um, now, <clears throat> the original ORUs uh, were, were characterized, uh, uh, the situation was characterized as being a core, the, the, the academic core consisted of academic departments and uh, ORUs, institutes, uh, existed on the periphery. Um, such research has, has been criticized as, be, as being uh, in silos uh, and uh, narrowing, and, and I can testify in that there are inherent tendencies. Uh, I've been part of a center for my entire academic career, and there is an inherent tendency to specialize more narrowly on particular topics. However, the, the innovative university has tended to evolve away from, from this dichotomy. Uh, and toward a greater integration in a matrix type of organization. Uh, if you think of a matrix in which uh, uh, the um, departments are the rows, the, or the columns, uh, the uh, inst centers and institutes are, are uh, the rows, and uh, an individual would belong to one department and perhaps have uh, joint appointments in other departments and then participate in, in uh, one or more centers or institutes as well. So another filling different uh, blocks in this uh, matrix. Um, well, this, this model already exists in academic health centers, uh, which consist of a maze of centers and institutes that interact with one another in a multiple ways. Individual faculty teach very little and are associated with several units besides their principal home. Um, as universities evolve towards greater research outputs, they too have evolved towards a, a matrix organization. Uh, Neil Smelser, uh, in assessing the dynamics of American universities has noted, departments have been hollowed out as intellectual communities, but retain vitality as political entities. Smelser's, Smelser makes this point in building a larger argument that the dynamics of American universities have largely been governed by a process of structural accretion. By structural accretion, he, um, he means the composite, uh, a composite form of growth through the incorporation of new functions over time without, however, shedding existing ones or splitting into separate organizations, uh, which sounds pretty much like a university. <laughs> as far as academic research is concerned, the most notable feature of the 21st century has been the incorporation of major new organizations uh, designed uh, to foster university research relevant to innovation. And uh, so here, I'm, here I call them accretions. These are research institutes that were all established by state policy, except the last uh, was uh, founded by industry, assisted by the state. Uh, all of these, uh, um, well, the federal, federal research policy actually plays a larger role in advancing this trend. And um, these are uh, major federal research centers of, uh, uh, since the year 2000. The top one, is, those are called MERSEX. Uh, they date from 2000. The, uh, national, the National Nanotechnology Initiative dated from, dates from 2003. These others are, are uh, even more uh, recent. Um, but uh, all of them represent uh, huge uh, uh, investments. Um, my own university, Penn State, has acted on this logic by creating a, a separate research structure to parallel the academic organization. It, uh, six overarching institutes were formed to organize and coordinate research in the life sciences, uh, materials, energy and the environment, social sciences, cyber science, and arts and humanities. Uh, these institutes have their own resources which they use to shape the direction of research in their particular area. Now, some of them have a lot of resources. Um, this, the, new, this, the, new, the new business, new building for the Materials Research Institute. Thus, research is no longer subject to the whims of academic departments. Rather, the institutes offer departments support for the hiring of faculty needed for interdisciplinary research teams. And the institutes then are able to, to structure the formation of, uh, of specifically targeted centers. The institutes contain a multiple centers which, uh, unlike former silos, are strongly interconnected. 
The, um, my guess is that public universities, or at least some of them, will develop more rapidly towards a matrix structure. They have a greater capacity for acquiring science-based technology centers, and, and uh, they have greater scope of research as well. And those, th that is what seems to be important uh, in, in uh, the current uh, 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 research environment. Private universities are reluctant to commit to expanding their research infrastructure. They prefer smaller and more prestigious science departments. However, the size and scope uh, demanded of, for, for interdisciplinary centers that federal agencies are promoting, uh, private uni universities above all will tend to protect the elite character of their undergraduate colleges since it is their s the source of their tuition revenues and alumni uh, donations. Uh, but in the, uh, now this, none of this applies to the biomedical sciences. They're NIH rules and uh, public, private universities, they all conform to the NIH culture. But in the physical sciences, computer science, engineering, uh, there are a handful of, of truly outstanding private universities, but public universities perform 70% of the research in those areas. And uh, it's there that uh, um, um, university, public universities will probably uh, uh, dominate even, even further in the future. Um, the, um, looking forward, the great unknown is whether, is the issue uh, raised by these national reports, whether or not the deterioration of state support will undermine the ability of public universities to function as these hubs of, inf of innovation. But let me uh, conc conclude on an optimistic note. Uh, in fact, I will quote uh, the rational optimist, Matt Ridley, who uh, says that uh, all human progress uh, has depended on, on uh, uh, exchange. And uh, uh, it was when humans began to exchange that uh, the human economic progress uh, began. I like this argument, uh, uh, but if, if exchange is the key to human progress, there's no place better suited for the exchange of ideas than universities. This is something that Ridley misses, by the way. And the evolving matrix structure of centers and institutes is designed explicitly to accelerate this kind of exchange. American universities, in particular, require and assist their faculties to develop deep expertise in a multitude of subjects. They exchange constantly, not only with local colleagues, but with experts in related fields around the world. Thus, universities, above all, are repositories of advanced learning. In their most consequential actions, universities seek to maximize learning, to the learning of faculty, the learning of students, and the sharing of that learning with others in the ways that enhance the learning for all. This is the basis for the unique contribution of universities to the social good. My fear is that contemporary trends of diminished funding, of the substitution of contingent faculty or online learning, will erode the sum total of learning that universities have to offer, and hence, uh, hence their potential to contribute to the social good. On the positive size, side of the ledger, the promise of generating innovi innovations for U.S. economy has brought universities resources to sustain the search for new learning. Going forward, if we don't screw up, this should be the greatest asset for the future of the innovative universities. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Roger. We'll open the uh, floor for questions. And why don't you just uh, yes, I'm, I'm really interested in hearing uh, how things look uh, at the University of California and and uh, on the, these these issues. Today's a sunny day. Sorry, good. Oh, good. Uh, I, I was. I was hoping you'd say a bit more about organizational structure and innovation, and, and that's sort of a, a black box in your talk. What have, what have we learned from from history that that would suggest either structures within universities that, that are more promoting promoting of innovation or less successful? Um, well, that's a good question. I don't know if, uh, if structures are uh, more most important uh, uh, culture is, is, is usually what uh, uh, 
people fall back on and the, uh, and, and the culture of culture supporting innovation uh, or, or commercialization of innovation is, uh, varies widely. So uh, um, most universities have been very interested in trying to promote uh, uh, entrepreneurial behavior among their faculty and they, so they hold workshops. Uh, uh, some, sometimes they give prizes. You know, it's not the, uh, the monetary uh, gains don't seem to be enough. <laughs> But uh, it, it's probably more, uh, it's more developing uh, uh, expertise in specific areas. And uh, you have to sort of go where, where uh, the interests are. And uh, the, at Penn State, uh, they've been very successful in, in, in uh, one of our, these institutes, the Institutes for Energy and, energy and the Environment. Uh, because uh, there's so much interest in both energy and the environment, uh, you know. And, um, whether you're for or against either of those things. But uh, uh, they've got a, a lot of, lot of uh, uh, industry buy-in there. Well, um, so when you start um, studying really applied areas that where, where there are practical spin-offs, I think, I think that's when uh, uh, intellectual property is likely to result. And then biotech, of course, is, a, is all by itself. Unique. Christina. Yes, uh, I like the presentation very much on the idea of universities as places of exchange. And I agree with you that one reason for the success of the University of California is uh, that we had those uh, organized research units. There is something that you were asking about the University of California that you didn't mention, and I always have believed was very important, and that is the graduate groups, uh, which are interdisciplinary graduate programs. And I believe that Davis has the most uh, interdisciplinary outlook in the entire country. Um, That's good. Yeah, so I was interested in, in your analysis. I agree that uh, that has been one of the, the strengths of the system. Mm -hmm. Now, with the economic crisis, of course, we don't know what's going to happen, but hopefully we'll be able to preserve this aspect of uh, the university as a place of exchange. Well, yes, that's, um, you know, this, this notion of uh, matrix kind of structure is uh, kind of predicated on doing inter interdisciplinary work uh, and uh, being able to be involved in, in research groups in different, in different centers. And uh, it's that kind of cross-cutting exchange that uh, I think is essential. Um, and that's what uh, the funding agencies are looking for as well. That's, and that's how uh, large questions have to be addressed as well. Actually, one of the main uh, functions of the centers is to act as uh, intermediaries and with the funds. So sure. That's the, how you do it. So that's an interesting function. Mm -hmm. um, I, I also very much like your presentation, and um, I'm, I'm intrigued by this 30 year chunks. <laughs> um, and that it worked, you ended in 2010, right? And you're predicting a look in the future. Right. Um, given what we're seeing now, it seems like most major research universities, public and private, are looking to further internationalize. Mm -hmm. their efforts with brick and mortar campuses or partnerships or research centers or you know what, what whatever it may be and certainly connecting with industries globally. Is that going to be part of the next 30 years or are the economics of that such that it really doesn't have much traction in the future? Um, I've never been never been able to understand the economics of, of uh, that uh, or what, what makes it compelling. <laughs> Um, I can I can see how they how they can establish international branches that uh, might be self-supporting, but they cert uh, certainly don't add much. And uh, so, are you going to send your most valued faculty members overseas to and, and lose them on your your own campus, or do you hire uh, people who uh, aren't quite so good to uh, to do that? It it's I'm not the person to ask uh, for the <laughs> For an explanation of that development, because I'm I'm not really convinced of it. But do you see it continuing for the next ten or twenty years? 
I, I see uh, universities pulling back. Um, in the Gulf states, a couple of universities have started initiatives and then withdrawn them. Um, they, uh, uh, they just simply don't all make sense. I mean, some, there's something that you can, you can do very cheaply. Uh, you can rent a, a floor of an office building in Singapore and uh, offer some courses. Um, it doesn't cost too much. But um, uh, setting up uh, a campus uh, is, is a risky endeavor, and I, I, I think as financial pressures mount, uh, university will, will be less eager to do that. And, or or, or they're, they're going to uh, try to do it online where there's a profit margin. So. Mm -hmm. the, um, the innovative university with the tech licensing income that uh, some believe are going to wipe away the, uh, the deficits, when we look across universities, we don't see that, that tech licensing generates all of that money, particularly all that much money, particularly if you subtract off the costs. Mm -hmm. um, so is, is the innovative university that you're talking about a university that's going to do this through tech licensing? Or is the university more important? And we've done some research on, for example, UC Berkeley. And the most important software programs that came out of Berkeley were never licensed. And were far more important to this state economy mm -hmm. than most of the things that were licensed. And so the innovative university can be an innovative university and throw the seeds of that knowledge out into the community and create wealth. Absolutely. Or it can try to control it and extract wealth from it. And so far, outside of a few universities and a few inventions, there just isn't that much money there. Because you know the invention mm -hmm. part is such a small part of actually getting a product into the market. And, and so, what is your innovative university? Is your innovative university the university that tries to collect pennies of each piece of knowledge that goes out, or is it something else? Well, it's, uh, it's misleading to, to just focus on, on patenting. You know, as, as I said, that's only one of the, one track of innovation. And, uh, you know, it doesn't, it, it looks like we're squeezing about as much, uh, as much in terms of patents and licenses out of universities as, as we can, given. Your graph shows well, that it's <laughs> a decreasing, in fact. More licenses and less income. Um, and your graph um, yeah, well, um, that's possible. But <laughs> uh, that, looking at it, I, f I found it difficult to, to see it going one way or another. But it's cer certainly uh, it's not taking off. And of course, the, the, uh, there's always this possibility of hitting the jackpot. Uh, so I mean, that's why people go to Las Vegas and, uh, and uh, maybe univer universities do, do a little bit. The, 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 bi the, the, the big money is, is doing economically relevant research. It's getting these, these, uh, uh, these centers for materials research, for, for the National Robotics Initiative. And uh, uh, universities have to be really well organized, uh, have a well organized uh, research structure in order to compete for, the, for those things. But, uh, but that's, that's what, uh, where the innovative university makes its biggest contribution. And universities have evolved in that direction because that's where the money's been coming from uh, more and more since, since the 1980s. And uh, so the uh, cooperation with industry um, is kind of a byproduct of, uh, of some of that. Um, in, inventions, uh, startups, and so forth um, as well. But uh, it's really, it's the research that um, is is the thing, and that that has been extraordinarily successful, and you know, and, and it looks like I mean, uh, unless the federal government uh, begins to shut down, it, it looks like uh, that's where the money is going to continue to come from. Andy, so uh, you started out to talk with a um, of, of around tuition and undergraduate education, mm -hmm. and the, the role that tuition revenues are increasing and playing in driving. And then subsequently. But then we ended with the conversation around research dollars and organized research units. 
and I, yeah. and I, and I don't, I see those as actually in, inherently in conflict, back to your point of contingent teaching. But having been involved in matrix organizations in, univers in, in universities and in organizations, I can tell you that the one thing that does increase as you matrix an organization is the number of meetings you have, <laughs> which takes away from both research and teaching. But, but I am curious, you know, to the extent that universities do pursue more ORU centers, institutions, and get towards a research focus that is problem-based and across discipline, they, they will inherently drift away from education, uh, undergraduate education. Uh, those faculty that, that are supposedly the, the engine of, of knowledge generation in universities. Yes. So aren't we, I mean, we are inherently seeing a future where those two conflict, right? That's, that's, that's right. They're, they're going in opposite directions. I mean, the, you know, the will base. They or will they simply continue that way? Well, you know, universities, they develop it incrementally. Um, we, we have people in Washington writing these, these wonderful reports, uh, you know, giving us national goals. Then we have uh, the university business manager saying, uh, how am I going to meet the, the, the budget for next year? And uh, so with this, this, this incremental kind of development, uh, research is doing fairly well, particularly economically relevant research. It's, it's getting, uh, bringing in centers, it's getting uh, you know, some support from industry and so forth. So that part of the university keeps developing. The core funding of the university is in real trouble. And, uh, it's not just tuition, um, it's, uh, and it's state funding, um, it's the fact that uh, the, you know, the, uh, the profit centers of the university, the law schools and business schools are now uh, sort of up against the wall in terms of, uh, of a lack of enrollment growth or, and so forth. Um, so um, if that continues, we're, we're, we're going to keep uh, sort of uh, shortchanging undergraduate education by, by providing it on the cheap. We've got to find ways to do it more cheaply if, if, we, if the money isn't there. But, um, you know, the, the model for universities is to, to get, get more money to keep doing things the way we have been doing them. And uh, what it looks like is that uh, the money's not going to be there and universities are not going to be able to keep doing things the way they have been. And that's, that's sort of uh, the real question for the, the next generation. Um, yes. So, Roger, one of the historical antecedents to this whole series was the Occupy protests and uh, the concerns for equity. Mm -hmm. And with that in mind, the most striking, you know, graphs you showed were the student debt. Yeah. Uh, and I'm just curious, from your vantage point, is anybody working on that, any ideas, any new funding, broad funding model possibilities that don't rely on this so much, or what, what do you see there? Um, no, it's, it's, uh, um, no one's doing anything, as far as I, as far as I know. I mean, there, they, there are uh, a couple great injustices taking place uh, here. Uh, one is that uh, the, the for-profits with 12% uh, of the students or something like that are taking one-third one of student loans. And that is just simply uh, throwing money down the toilet. Not only that, it's worse than throwing money down the toilet because people are being burdened with, you know, people have to go, go retrieve that money somehow or pay it back. And um, uh, I mean, that's a, a public policy failure uh, where there, there simply should be limits uh, on uh, the kind of the kind of uh, uh, the availability of loans for for uh, these for-profit uh, schools, um, the other source is is the the exorbitant tuition in the private sector, so that uh, students of upper middle class students who are are very wealthy still have to borrow money, and then the the other source is the fact that. Um, uh, public university tuition has gone up, and it's so that uh, the ex the cost of higher education in a, in a public university, residential, uh, uh, so far exceeds the median family income that is expected family contribution that that uh, most students are uh, forced to uh, receive financial aid. So. Um, 
Um, that's not uh, one, of the one of the issues that you hear our congressman uh, talking about uh, resolving. It seems like the, if you look at it in terms of broad social costs, the cost of allowing that to continue is, is even greater than just yeah. lowering tuition. Well, the, the Obama administration has, has tried to make the terms of the loans less onerous. I mean, that's about the only thing that's, that's happened. But uh, it is pretty onerous because uh, you can't get out of it through bankruptcy. And, you know, there are stories in the paper all the time about, uh, you know, the sob stories about students that borrowed more, much more than they should have. Roger, thank you very much. Um, lots of questions, no easy answers. And, That's right. and That's I sure. wonder, uh, I don't have the answer, but on the other hand, I have to be sometimes both the pessimist and the optimist. One thing I, I noticed, I wonder if you comment on, we talked about innovation, and what I'm thinking, and it's a little bit in line with Martin's observation about the value the university adds to society at large, is we're not going to have innovation unless we have innovators. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I feel somehow we must do is we have to educate our undergraduates in a very robust and rich way so that they can become graduate students and eventually the innovators of the next generation. So I, I guess I'd say is the sense I got from your depiction is that the various pieces of this fabric are pulling apart and yet somehow we can't let that happen. I'm sure, I wonder if you could, could meditate on that. Yeah. Well, if, you know, if the fabric does uh, pull apart, uh, it's going to happen, uh, it's going to happen down, lower down in the system. Um, it's the, the regional state universities are the ones that are going to have uh, uh, enrollment crunch. Uh, the the uh, private colleges uh, on, that, aren't, that don't have a large endowment uh, are, are, they're facing very, very poor uh, uh, financial prospects right now. That's what sort of what the Moody's report uh, uh, predicted. So it, I, I guess in terms of, uh, you know, the fabric ripping or whatever the metaphor is, uh, it, it'll happen down there first. And of course, uh, the research universities are, are best able to handle them, them, themselves. But um, uh, it, um, Institutions uh, adapt incrementally, as I said before, a, a year at a time, and uh, um, they'll do, do what they have to do. But if, 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 uh, it, it, if it comes to the, the fact that uh, some institutions start failing or, you, or states start closing some institutions, then you'll know that uh, it real, it's a real crisis. Let me ask a, a question that's related to that. Do you think that we have built a system that is trying to educate too many people at the university level? Um, yeah, I, I think that, that there are the expectations in the uh, higher education policy community is that uh, we can just keep uh, educating more and more people. And um, uh, there, there are two problems. One problem is the preparation problem. I mean, it's the K, K through 12 system is not uh, preparing enough people. It prepares some people very well, but uh, it's, it's not preparing 75% of uh, the students for uh, post-secondary education. And the other, the other problem is, is the community college system uh, where uh, uh, relevant post-secondary credentials might be earned, but uh, they're underfunded tremendously. And, and the Obama administration was correct to identify the community college as, as, as the, you know, the place where everybody could get some post-secondary education. But uh, there's no money for it. And um, you, know, you know that best in California where, where they, I guess they're, they're turning students away. <laughs> so uh, um, uh, if, we, if we're going to educate this many people uh, or more, we need to, to find more more ways to educate them. And uh, certainly the system that we have now and where marketers for for-profit uh, for institutions uh, uh, sort of hoodwink students into signing up for loans and Pell Grants in order to take uh, vocational courses 
guarantee, you know, with these wild uh, promises of jobs, that's not the way to go. But that's that's the system. So, <clears throat> do you think that the uh, silo disciplines, uh, I, I'm in the social sciences, sociology, economics, where we tend to educate large numbers of people through relatively standardized courses, is that going to create innovators? Is that the way the undergraduate education is going to create people, particularly in a, in a society where the old structures of the forest structures, you went to GM and you marched up through the GM ladder uh, to eventually became manager and then you retired the, for the college educator, or you went into a state bureaucracy and you spent your 30 years and you ended as a manager. Mm -hmm. Is the education that's being offered that seems to be highly, relatively structured, you take this class, this class, this class, and you get through, you get your degree, and now you join the bureaucracy and you move up the rest of your life. That bureaucracy is exploding. Yeah. In the corporate sector, it's mostly gone. Mm -hmm. uh, in the government sector, it looks like it's going to be uh, eviscerated or weakened. Is that structure of the silo disciplines marching up through that way in the university for four years, is that creating the people, the, the human capital, the innovative people that are going to have to go out there and weave careers together? Well, uh, you know, probably not on the undergraduate level. I know engineering schools are, are putting a lot of emphasis on design and entrepreneurship even at the undergraduate level. Um, outside of the business school, uh, I'm not sure business schools do that very well. You know, it really takes uh, uh, graduate uh, training and, uh, and we're developing more professional uh, oriented uh, master's degrees to give people, uh, you know, uh, graduate training that's, that's much more oriented towards towards uh, the workplace. So um, I think the under, undergraduate majors really represent kind of an intellectual base for uh, further development and uh, not uh, a ticket into the bureaucracy. So but what you're arguing here is that they're getting four years of debt and then they better have two more years of debt <coughs> to get to somewhere. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a real problem. And uh, you know, I wonder if, if uh, you know, there's this huge fall off in the applications to law school. It, it's, uh, I wonder if, if the fact that students are, uh, are graduating uh, with so much debt is, is preventing um, the uh, enrollments in graduate school, which is, which is you know, probably what we, we really need. I want to push you one more step here. Mark Zuckerberg, I mean, uh, we didn't invest in Facebook, thankfully, but uh, so many of the founders of these young firms are actually undergraduates or just graduated and are is is are those role models of those the kinds of people we I mean Zuckerberg obviously is iconic that we need to be thinking about how we can make a UC Davis give them that kind of incentive, that kind of knowledge, that kind of go try something, be crazy while you're here, don't worry so much about your, you know, the 10 credit, the 16 credit hours times three gives you enough and you're making a satisfactory progress, but we need to find ways to allow them to express their innovativeness and their creativeness now, or do we need to wait for graduates? Well, there, there are a lot of programs that uh, try to do that, and uh, um, you know, if, I don't know of any program that tells them to, uh, you know, to drop out and try to be like Bill Gates, but <laughs> or Michael Dell. <coughs> um, uh, I, whether that can be taught in a classroom, I don't know, but you can certainly, you can certainly, uh, you know, open up the possibilities, uh, give students a, di a different kind of uh, message. Uh, from their education, that uh, um, education isn't learning 
uh, everything that's in this textbook and uh, regurgitating it, but, uh, but rather it's, it's figuring out how to do things on your own. You know, and, and once uh, students get that, uh, they, they are likely to behave in a, in a much more entrepreneurial way. So um, I, know, I know there are programs like that. Um, um, I, I regard them as being very optimistic, <laughs> but uh, maybe, maybe they're probably worth trying. Welcome. Roger, thank you very much for coming well, and sharing you. your wisdom with us. We uh, really appreciate it. <laughs> I don't know. It was wisdom, but uh, uh, there are some good questions, and uh, I thank you for your really comments. Okay, great. <laughs> Wonderful. You're all welcome to the reception. Thank you for coming.